Hello, my name's Maddie. Welcome to my storyland. Oscar Wilde was born in Dublin, Ireland, on the 16th of October, 1854. His image, these days, is that of a bon viveur, a sensualist and libertine of the Victorian era, a bohemian poet and playwright, a flamboyant raconteur immersed in a life of splendour, always ready with a choice witticism or two. After all, he was the fellow who, when passing through customs control in New York in 1882, boldly stated, I have nothing to declare but my genius. It's easy to imagine him sipping champagne at some exclusive soiree in which he was, of course, the guest of honour, or perhaps strolling in London's Piccadilly, taking the air before another sold-out performance of one of his plays, Salome, perhaps, or The Importance of Being Earnest or in an oak-panelled room, as a hushed audience of the cream of society listened to him in rapture as he gave select readings from his latest novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Some might recall something about him being homosexual, but surely that didn't really affect him. He was famous, loved, and revered. He was rich and a member of the upper classes. His life was long, unfettered, and brilliant. He had access to all the doors and left none unopened. Didn't he once say, I can resist everything except temptation? Some of this is true. He did write and say those things. He was famous before he was infamous, and he was loved and revered before he was forgotten. And he was gay. And because he was gay, he was sentenced to two years of hard labour, first briefly in Newgate Prison, then in Pentonville and Wandsworth Prisons, and finally in Reading Jail. During one of those transfers, he was recognised at a train station by some of the commuters. A crowd gathered round him and spat on him. He would spend his days in prison pointlessly walking on a treadmill for hours on end, or sometimes picking apart fibres from scraps of navy ropes. Most of the time he was barred from speaking with other inmates entirely, at times even being forced to wear a heavy veil to cover his face, lest he be recognised. In Reading, the guards would never address him by name. They would refer to him only as C-33, for his was the third cell on the third floor in Sea Ward. He was released from prison on the 18th of May, 1897, almost two years to the day, after starting his sentence. He left England that evening, taking a boat to France. He would never set foot in the United Kingdom again. He died three years later, at the age of 46, in a cheap room in a run-down hotel on the Rue Jacob in Paris, impoverished and shunned by nearly all of his former friends. Which brings us to the Ballad of Reading Jail. This poem was the last work of Oscar Wilde to be published in his lifetime and the story of the poem is true. Some five months after Wilde was transferred to Reading Jail, he did notice a new inmate, Charles Thomas Aldridge. The man had murdered his wife in a fit of rage and was awaiting trial. The trial was not expected to be a long one. Aldridge had turned himself in soon after the murder and made a full confession. In fact, the jury took a grand total of two minutes to find him guilty. He accepted the verdict and by all accounts, showed intense remorse. He refused all attempts at reprieve, even petitioning the Home Secretary to ensure that the sentence would be carried out. And on July 7th, 1896, it was. The 30-year-old Wooldridge was hung by the neck until dead and buried in an unmarked grave. Wilde never spoke with Wooldridge, but he did note him in the prison yard, as the poem describes, and it affected him deeply. He started writing the poem in 1897, almost immediately after settling in France, and it was published in February of 1898. The poem is dedicated to CTW, and was at first not even published in Oscar Wilde's name. At Wilde's request, it was published under the name C-33. And today, it is my pleasure to read it to you. Are you ready? Then let's begin. The Ballad of Reading Jail 
by Oscar Wilde. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trialmen in a suit of shabby grey, a cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring, and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing, when a voice behind me whispered low, that fellow's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel, and though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step, and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young, and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife, because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long, some sell and others buy, some do the deed with many tears, and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth about his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty place. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day who watch him when he tries to weep and when he tries to pray, who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. He does not wake at dawn to see dread figures throng his room, the shivering chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor all in shiny black with the yellow face of doom. He does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse-mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer blows. He does not know that sickening thirst that sands one's throat before the hangman with his gardener's gloves slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs that the throat may thirst no more. He does not bend his head to hear the burial office read nor while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead, cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed. He does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass. He does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass, nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of Syaphas. Six weeks our guardsman walked the yard in a suit of shabby grey. His cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay, but I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every wandering cloud that trailed its raveled fleeces by. He did not wring his hands, as do those witless men who dare to try to rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair. He only looked upon the sun, and drank the morning air. He did not wring his hands, nor weep, nor did he peek or pine, but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne. With open mouth he drank the sun as though it had been wine. And I, and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring, forgot if we ourselves had done a great or little thing, and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing. And strange it was to see him pass with a step so light and gay, and strange it was to see him look so wistfully at the day, and strange it was to think that he had such a debt to pay. For oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot, 
But grim to see is the gallows tree with its adder bitten root, and green or dry, a man must die before it bears its fruit. The loftiest place is that seat of grace for which all worldlings try, but who would stand in hempen band upon a scaffold high, and through a murderer's collar take his last look at the sky? It is sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes, is delicate and rare. But it is not sweet, with nimble feet, to dance upon the air. So with curious eyes and sick surmise, we watched him day by day, and wondered if each one of us would end the selfsame way, for none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. At last the dead man walked no more amongst the trial men, and I knew that he was standing up in the black dock's dreadful pen, and that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. Like two doomed ships the pass in storm, we had crossed each other's way. We had made no sign, we said no word, we had no word to say, for we did not meet in the holy night, but in the shameful day. A prison wall was round us both, two outcast men were we. The world had thrust us from its heart, and God from out his care, and the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare. In debtor's yard the stones are hard, and the dripping wall is high, so it was there he took the air, beneath the leaden sky. By each side a warder walked, for fear the man might die. Or else he sat with those who watched his anguish night and day, who watched him when he rose to weep, and when he crouched to pray, who watched him lest himself should rob their scaffold of its prey. The governor was strong upon the Regulations Act. The doctor said that death was but a scientific fact, and twice a day the chaplain called and left a little tract. And twice a day he smoked his pipe and drank his quart of beer. His soul was resolute and held no hiding place for fear. He often said that he was glad the hangman's hands were near. But why he said so strange a thing, no warder dared to ask, for he to whom a watcher's doom is given as his task must set a lock upon his lips and make his face a mask, or else he might be moved and try to comfort or console. And what should human pity do, pent up in murderer's hole? What words of grace in such a place could help a brother's soul? With slouch and swing around the ring we trod the fool's parade, we did not care, we knew we were the devil's own brigade, and shaven head and feet of lead make a merry masquerade. We tore the tarry ropes to shreds with blunt and bleeding nails, we rubbed the doors and scrubbed the floors and cleaned the shining rails, and rank by rank we soaped the plank and clattered with the pails. We sewed the sacks, we broke the stones, we turned the dusty drill, we banged the tins and bawled the hymns and sweated on the mill. But in the heart of every man, terror was lying still. So still it lay that every day crawled like a weed-clogged wave, and we forgot the bitter lot that waits for fool and knave, till once, as we tramped in from work, we passed an open grave. With yawning mouth the yellow hole gaped for a living thing, the very mud cried out for blood to the thirsty asphalt ring, and we knew that ere one day grew fair, some prisoner had to swing. Right in we went, with soul intent on death and dread and doom. The hangman with his little bag went shuffling through the gloom, and each man trembled as he crept into his numbered tomb. That night the empty corridors were full of forms of fear, and up and down the iron town stole feet we could not hear, and through the bars that hid the stars white faces seemed to peer. He lay as one who lies and dreams in a pleasant meadow land. The watcher watched him as he slept, and could not understand how one could sleep so sweet a sleep with a hangman close at hand. But there is no sleep when men must weep who never yet have wept. So we, the fool, the fraud, the knave, that endless vigil kept, and through each brain on hands of pain another's terror crept. Alas, it is a fearful thing to feel another's guilt, for right within the sword of sin pierced to its poisoned hilt, and as molten lead were the tears we shed for the blood we had not spilt. 
The warders, with their shoes of felt, crept by each padlocked door, and peeped and saw, with eyes of awe, grey figures on the floor, and wondered why men knelt to pray who never prayed before. All through the night we knelt and prayed, mad mourners of a corpse. The troubled plumes of midnight were the plumes upon a hearse, and bitter wine upon a sponge was the saviour of remorse. The cock crew, the red cock crew, but never came the day. The crooked shape of terror crouched in the corners where we lay, and each evil sprite that walks by night before us seemed to play. They glided past, they glided fast, like travellers through a mist. They mocked the moon in a rigadoon of delicate turn and twist, and with formal pace and loathsome grace the phantoms kept their tryst. With mop and mow we saw them go, slim shadows hand in hand. About, about, in ghostly rout, they trod a saraband, and the damned grotesques made arabesques like the wind upon the sand. With the pirouettes of marionettes they tripped on pointed tread, but with flutes of fear they filled the ear as their grisly mask they led. And loud they sang, and loud they sang, for they sang to wake the dead. Ahoy, they cried, the world is wide, but fettered limbs go lame, and once or twice to throw the dice is a gentlemanly game, but he does not win who plays with sin in the secret house of shame. No things of air these antics were that frolicked with such glee to men whose lives were held in gyves and whose feet might not go free. Ah, wounds of Christ, they were living things most terrible to see. Around, around they waltzed and wound, some wheeled in smirking pairs, with the mincing step of demi-rep some sidled up the stairs, and with subtle sneer and fawning leer each helped us at our prayers. The morning wind began to moan, but still the night went on, through its giant loom the web of gloom crept till each thread was spun, and as we prayed we grew afraid of the justice of the sun. The moaning wind went wandering round the weeping prison wall, till like a wheel of turning steel we felt the minutes crawl. O oh, moaning wind, what had we done to have such a seneschal? At last I saw the shadowed bars, like a lattice wrought in lead, move right across the whitewashed wall that faced my three-plank bed, and I knew that somewhere in the world God's dreadful dawn was red. At six o'clock, we cleaned our cells, at seven all was still, but the sow and swing of a mighty wing the prison seemed to fill, for the Lord of Death, with icy breath, had entered in to kill. He did not pass in purple pomp, nor ride a moon-white steed. Three yards of cord and a sliding board are all the gallows need, so with rope of shame the herald came to do the sacred deed. We were as men who through a fen of filthy darkness grope. We did not dare to breathe a prayer or give our anguish scope. Something was dead in each of us, and what was dead was hope. For man's grim justice goes its way and will not swerve aside. It slays the weak, it slays the strong, it has a deadly stride. With iron heel it slays the strong, the monstrous parricide. We waited for the stroke of eight, each tongue was thick with thirst, for the stroke of eight is the stroke of fate that makes a man accursed, and fate will use a running noose for the best man and the worst. We had no other thing to do save to wait for the sign to come, so like things of stone in a valley lone, quiet we sat and dumb, but each man's heart beat thick and quick, like a madman on a drum. With sudden shock, the prison clock smote on the quivering air, and from all the jail rose up a wail of impotent despair, like the sound that frightened marshes hear from a leper in his lair. And as one sees most fearful things in the crystal of a dream, we saw the greasy hempen rope hooked to the blackened beam, and heard the prayer the hangman's snare strangled into a scream. And all the woe that moved him so that he gave that bitter cry, and the wild regrets and the bloody sweats, none knew so well as I. For he who lives more lives than one, more deaths than one must die. There is no chapel on the day on which they hang a man. The chaplain's heart is far too sick 
or his face is far too wan, for there is written in his eyes which none should look upon. So they kept us close till nigh on noon, and then they rang the bell, and the warders, with their jingling keys, opened each listening cell, and down the iron stair we tramped, each from his separate hell. Out into God's sweet air we went, but not in wanted way, for this man's face was white with fear, and that man's face was grey, and I never saw sad men who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw sad men who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue we prisoners called the sky, and at every careless cloud that passed in happy freedom by. But there were those amongst us all who walked with downcast head, and knew that, had each got his due, they should have died instead. He had but killed a thing that lived, whilst they had killed the dead. For he who sins a second time wakes a dead soul to pain, and draws it from its spotted shroud, and makes it bleed again, and makes it bleed great gouts of blood, and makes it bleed in vain. Like ape or clown in monstrous garb, with crooked arrows starred, silently we went round and round the slippery asphalt yard, silently we went round and round, and no man spoke a word. Silently we went round and round, and through each hollow mind the memory of dreadful things rushed like a dreadful wind, and horror stalked before each man, and terror crept behind. The warders strutted up and down and kept their herd of brutes. Their uniforms were spick and span, and they wore their Sunday suits. But we knew the work they had been at by the quicklime on their boots. For where a grave had opened wide, there was no grave at all, only a stretch of mud and sand by the hideous prison wall, and a little heap of burning lime, that the man should have his pall. For he has a pall, this wretched man, such as few men can claim, deep down below a prison yard, naked for greater shame. He lies with fetters on each foot, wrapped in a sheet of flame. And all the while the burning lime eats flesh and bone away. It eats the brittle bone by night and the soft flesh by day. It eats the flesh and bones by turns, but it eats the heart alway. For three long years they will not sow, or root, or seedling there. For three long years the unblessed spot will sterile be, and bare, and look upon the wandering sky with unreproachful stare. They think a murderer's heart would taint each simple seed they sow. It is not true. God's kindly earth is kindlier than men know, and the red rose would but blow more red, and the white rose whiter blow. Out of his mouth a red, red rose, out of his heart a white. For who can say by what strange way Christ brings his will to light? Since the barren staff the pilgrim bore bloomed in the great Pope's sight. But neither milk-white rose nor red may bloom in prison air. The shard, the pebble, and the flint are what they give us there. For flowers have been known to heal a common man's despair. So never will wine red rose or white petal by petal fall on that stretch of mud and sand that lies by the hideous prison wall to tell the men who tramp the yard that God's son died for all. Yet though the hideous prison wall still hems him round and round, and a spirit man not walk by night that is with fetters bound, and a spirit may not weep that lies in such unholy ground, he is at peace, this wretched man, at peace. Or will be soon. There is no thing to make him mad, nor does terror walk at noon, for the lampless earth in which he lies has neither sun nor moon. They hanged him as a beast is hanged. They did not even toll a requiem that might have brought rest to his startled soul, but hurriedly they took him out and hid him in a hole. They stripped him of his canvas clothes and gave him to the flies, they mocked the swollen purple throat and the stark and staring eyes, and with laughter loud they heaped the shroud in which their convict lies. The chaplain would not kneel to pray by his dishonoured grave, nor mark it with that blessed cross that Christ for sinners gave, because the man was one of those whom Christ came down to save. Yet all is well. He has but passed to life's appointed bourne, 
and alien tears will fill for him pity's long broken urn, for his mourners will be outcast men, and outcasts always mourn. I know not whether laws be right or whether laws be wrong. All that we know who lie in jail is that the wall is strong, and that each day is like a year, a year whose days are long. But this I know, that every law that men have made for man, since first man took his brother's life and the sad world began, but straws the wheat and saves the chaff with a most evil fan. This too I know, and wise it were if each could know the same, that every prison that men build is built with bricks of shame, and bound with bars, lest Christ should see how men their brothers maim. With bars they blur the gracious moon, and blind the goodly sun, and they do well to hide their hell, for in it things are done that son of God nor son of man ever should look upon. The vilest deeds, like poison weeds, bloom well in prison air. It is only what is good in man that wastes and withers there. Pale anguish keeps the heavy gate, and the warder is despair. For they starve the little frightened child till it weeps both night and day, and they scourge the weak and flog the fool and jibe the old and grey. And some grow mad and all grow bad, and none a word may say. Each narrow cell in which we dwell is foul and dark latrine, and the fetid breath of living death chokes up each grated screen, and all but lust is turned to dust in humanity's machine. The brackish water that we drink creeps with a loathsome slime, and the bitter bread they weigh in scales is full of chalk and lime, and sleep will not lie down but walks wild-eyed and cries to time. But though lean hunger and green thirst, like asp with adder fight, we have little care of prison fare, for what chills and kills outright is that every stone one lifts by day becomes one's heart by night. With midnight always in one's heart and twilight in one's cell, we turn the crank or tear the rope, each in his separate hell, and the silence is more awful far than the sound of a brazen bell and never a human voice comes near to speak a gentle word, and the eye that watches through the door is pitiless and hard, and by all forgot we rot and rot with soul and body marred. And thus we rust life's iron chain, degraded and alone, and some men curse, and some men weep, and some men make no moan, but God's eternal laws are kind and break the heart of stone. And every human heart that breaks in prison, cell, or yard is at that broken box that gave its treasure to the Lord and filled the unclean leper's house with the scent of costliest nard. Ah, happy day, they whose hearts can break and peace of pardon win. How else may man make straight his plan and cleanse his soul from sin? How else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in? And he of the swollen purple throat and the stark and staring eyes waits for the holy hands that took the thief to paradise, and a broken and a contrite heart the Lord will not despise. The man in red who reads the law gave him three weeks of life, three little weeks in which to heal his soul of his soul strife, and cleanse from every blot of blood the hand that held the knife. And with tears of blood he cleansed the hand, the hand that held the steel, for only blood can wipe out blood, and only tears can heal. And the crimson stain that was of Cain became Christ's snow-white seal. In Reading Jail, by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame, and in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In burning, winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there, till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love, by all let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. And with that, 
I bid you farewell. I hope you enjoyed the poem. Perhaps I'll see you again. I certainly hope so. Until then. Hello, Maddie here. Thanks for watching me read stuff. There are lots more videos of me reading stuff over on my channel, and if there's other stuff you'd really like me to read, just let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and I upload new videos all the time, so maybe hit the bell icon too, so you can get notified when new stuff comes out. Thanks again for watching, and see you next time.